Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Quick Bytes webinar on finding collaborators for your research. So today we're going to be talking broadly about research collaboration, why it benefits research generally, and how it can contribute to your research specifically. My name is Ben Breeds. I plan and deliver a range of training programs to support the business school's research students, and I'll be talking briefly on the good, the bad, and the ugly of research collaboration, as well as how to put yourself out there as a potential collaborator. I'm here today with Kami Oi. Hello who is one of the library's gurus who promotes effective use of their search tools, research services and other resources to help students answer their big questions. Now, if you think of any, if you think of any questions as we're going through our webinar today, please add them, add them to the chat pod uh, and we'll address them at the end. So, so it's these big questions that essentially you as researchers have dedicated part of your lives to answering. If you've chosen to grapple with a research topic for four years, chances are you have been and will be thinking about it for your whole life. Researchers tackle questions and challenge human beings to better understand their planet and themselves. Your research is important. It has the potential to have broad impacts and therefore doesn't it deserve to be supported by a breadth of opinions, methods and knowledge. Collaboration has the potential to broaden the ability of other researchers to engage with your topic, Australian, as, as well as strengthening the impact your research generates. In practical terms, bodies like the Australian Research Council provide substantial grant funding, which, by being linked to the potential impact of your research project, is therefore closely linked to your ability to collaborate. By encouraging researchers to design effective solutions in partnership with academia, government and industry, end users are presented with better solutions to their problems. History is full of examples of academic teamwork achieving outcomes that may not have come from one person's experience alone. It took a biologist, James Watson, to team up with a physicist, Francis Crick, to determine the structure of the DNA double helix. The life molecule's composition plays a key role in our understanding of genetic inheritance, which has fascinated scientists for a hundred years. The different specialities and perspectives of the collaborators were key to this question being addressed. Collaboration is therefore intuitively beneficial, and some would even say that in a globalised and interconnected society, collaboration is almost inevitable. However, I think that it's important to note that careful planning and management of collaboration is necessary for its full benefits to be enjoyed. Robin Keast and Michael Charles from Southern Cross University explore this theme in their article, 10 Rules for Successful Research Collaboration, including not just jumping on that bandwagon for its own sake. Because, I mean, collaboration can be time consuming. Uh, you've got to coordinate the various players, you've got to set and monitor expectations, and you need to take the time to make sure that each partner's needs are being met. Keast and Charles note that it is important to understand the costs and risks, which can be done in part by leveraging existing relationships first and focusing on the shared benefits to the partners. A link to this article is provided in the webinar slides. Another benefit of collaboration is increased citation. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, citation broadly refers to how often your research is referenced by others, and it's a commonly held indicator of the importance of a particular piece of work. Being well cited in your own field is an aspiration of many researchers, but those who collaborate with authors from other fields of specialty open themselves up to a whole new array of potential citation. Academic evidence that co-authorship increases citation has been well established. So we're going to uh, move on now to look at some of the tools uh, that you can actually use uh, to look for research collaborators. Just at the top of uh, the slide here, you will see I've given you uh, the URL to the library's research impact guide. And uh, if you go into this URL in your own time, uh, it will give you a list of uh, the useful tools uh, that you can uh, look at in your own time. I have uh, just briefly listed here three types of tools that you can use when you're trying to look for collaborators. The first one, research performance evaluation tools. These are essentially tools um, that use what's called research metrics, 
or quantitative measures uh, to assess the performance of a researcher. So we're talking about things like um, how many publications uh, the author has put out, how often they have been cited, uh, what their collaboration record uh, has been like, whether they've published in top journals and so forth. The second one that you can look at are what we call academic networking sites. And these are things like uh, ResearchGate, Academia, .edu and SSRN. You can also look at uh, social media, so things like Twitter and blogs can be quite useful for identifying collaborators. Now, uh, for today's focus, I'm going to do you a couple of uh, demonstrations. I'm going to focus mainly on the first two, SciVal and Insights. These are the uh, performance evaluation tools uh, that show you the research metrics of the researcher. I will then briefly talk about SSRN, which is the Social Science Research Network, and uh, briefly cover Twitter as well. So I'm going to take you now live uh, to do a demo for you on SciVal. Okay, so hopefully uh, you will see SciVal uh, appearing on your screen. Now, uh, SciVal is uh, a tool uh, which you can sign up for. Um, I should have uh, shown you the, the previous slide, which had uh, the URL for SciVal. But essentially, it is um, a tool uh, which uses data from Scopus, which is uh, a database that we subscribe to. On uh, SciVal, this is what uh, the front page looks like when you first uh, enter. And in order to look for uh, collaborators, even though there is a collaboration tab, uh, if, when you're trying to look for individual collaborators, it is easier to do it from the overview module. So we're going to just click onto that. It should pop up in a minute. Okay. So this is uh, the overview page, which uh, you will typically see. I'm going to uh, take you firstly to this tab here called my SciVal. And this is kind of like your personalized area where you can try to define uh, the research topic that you're interested in, in order to see uh, which researcher works in your area. So under topics and uh, research areas, if you click on define a new research area, and then basically you just put in uh, some key terms related to your research area. So say, for example, I'm doing work on uh, cyberbullying. And I want to try to find uh, what other researchers are working on this topic. So simply by uh, putting in my search term and then clicking on the search button, Cyril will then look through uh, the Scopus records to identify uh, different researchers working in this area. One of the nice things about SciVal is that while you may know the key researchers uh, for your particular field, you don't necessarily know other researchers working on the same topic from other disciplines. So this is where using something like SciVal can be quite useful to identify collaborators, perhaps from another discipline. Now, uh, Assuming I want to look for collaborators in the field of psychology, I can simply place a check next to the psychology option and click uh, limit to so that the system limits my search only to psychology. And when I click next step, uh, it will prompt me to save my research area. So I'll give it uh, a meaningful name. So, and it just puts the date that you have saved uh, by default here. Now, when I click uh, on the save and finish, and when I go back to the overview module, you will see now that it's populated with um, a tab here, cyberbullying. And if you click now on this auto link, it will bring up for you a list of uh, the key authors uh, working on the topic of cyberbullying from uh, across uh, the psychology field. Now, uh, to try to then see uh, whether the author is um, a potential collaborator, you can always click on the author's name. And this will give you uh, an idea of uh, how they have been doing in terms of uh, past publications. So you can see uh, this particular researcher has had about 76 uh, publications. 
And it gives you the other metrics as well. So um, this one here, uh, each of the publications have received on average uh, 13.4 citations. Just closing out of that, uh, you can also, uh, if you wanted to focus more closely on the other metrics uh, that are available from Scopus, you can simply just place a check next to uh, the authors you're interested in and drag and drop the names and it will automatically appear uh, in the group up here. From here, you can then just again click on the author and it should bring up for you uh, more citation metrics. The other thing that you can do uh, once you've uh, assessed uh, the person, so you've got the summary. If you click on the, I should have mentioned, the collaboration tab, this gives you an idea as well of um, their past collaboration, how much they have collaborated internationally as well as uh, locally. And so there's quite a lot that you can explore uh, from within SciVal. You can, if you had a couple of uh, researchers in mind and you wanted to compare how one researcher performs against another, uh, you can over here click also on the uh, benchmarking module and that will populate for you um, the various uh, authors that you have selected. Oops, I need to go to this one here, researchers. So say I want to uh, benchmark these three authors. And so it gives you quite a nice graphic here. Uh, and you can select uh, the particular metric that you want to uh, compare each of the authors to. So SciVal is uh, a, a pretty useful tool to use uh, in terms of looking for collaborators. Um, I'm going to just uh, move on now to show you the next tool. So let me just get out of SciVal. So we had talked about uh, SciVal as a potential tool for looking for collaborators. Another tool that we have uh, in the library which is also a performance uh, evaluation tool, is Insights. This one takes uh, its data from another database called uh, Web of Science. And up, up here on this path up here, given you um, the route that you can take from the library website uh, in order to uh, look for insights. As with uh, SciVal, uh, you have to register uh, for an account in order to access um, insights. In terms of uh, the coverage, insights, as with SciVal, tends to be stronger uh, for the health and physical sciences and less so for the uh, social science and arts and humanities. I'm going to uh, just very quickly take you to do uh, a quick demo of insights. So I'm going to uh, exit out of this slide. OK, so this is uh, what insights looks like when you first access it. In order to look for individual collaborators, the easiest thing to do is to click on the people tile. Oh, this is not good. So you can see uh, it's popped up with something to say. The server is not responding. Hmm. Not quite sure what we can do. Let me just quickly go back. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not sure we'll be able to get our insights up for you. Uh, if not, we do have uh, a video on our subject guide, which uh, takes you through the steps of uh, how to look for collaborators for this. So I apologize. Um, this is uh, a bit unfortunate. I'll just close out of it, actually. So sorry about that. Uh, I don't think insights is going to um, happen. I will move on now to uh, the final uh, demo that I was going to show you. And this is uh, SSRN, which is the Social Science Research Network. So unlike uh, SciVal and Insights, this one uh, is an academic networking site. It is actually also uh, a research repository. And this particular source uh, is it's good for people who are working in the social science or humanities area. So you'll find uh, if you're working in these areas, SciVal and Insights uh, perhaps provides less coverage. So SSRN uh, might be a good alternative. One of the nice things about SSRN is that uh, it's got quite a lot of specialized disciplinary networks. So whether you're working in the area of political science, economics, gender studies, and so forth, 
uh, you should be able to find hopefully a network uh, that suits your research area. SSRN uh, earlier this year was taken over by Elsevier, who are the makers of um, Scofus and Cyvel. And one of the things they have done is to incorporate uh, something called the Plum X matrix, which gives you um, some quite useful metrics to assess uh, how well someone has done. So this is uh, a new thing that you see on SSRN, and I'll give you a quick demo in a minute. One of the other things SSRN does is to give you uh, the contact information for autists. So again, this can be very useful when you're trying to uh, make contact with a potential collaborator. So I'm going to do a quick demo of SSRN for you now. Okay, so this is uh, SSRN. Uh, the search is really very simple. You just simply put in a keyword related to your topic area. If you wanted to uh, limit your search to a particular discipline, you can simply click on the advanced search and then put in uh, your keyword. So say, for example, I'm doing research on the gig economy. And if I wanted to then select uh, a particular network, I can just limit my um, field to that network to see uh, what researchers come up for that particular uh, network. I'm just going to leave it as uh, across all the networks. And when I click on search, uh, it will give me a list of uh, the different researchers working in the area of gig economy. Now, the results by default, uh, it displays by uh, the most, uh, the downloads with um, the, the most numbers of downloads, I should say. When you click on each of the title, it will then give you um, the Plumex metrics that I was telling you about. So th this gives you an idea of how much attention uh, that particular paper has received. If you wanted to explore more uh, on the author, you can simply click on uh, the link that's given, and it should come up with a brief profile on them, as well as uh, a list of some of the, the, the papers that uh, they have written. So this is also a good way to see um, who they have collaborated with in the past. And you can, as I mentioned before, click on uh, the contact link and you'll be able to access uh, the email and sometimes uh, the phone number of the researcher. I will just very briefly uh, finish off my uh, part of this uh, session by talking about Twitter. So Twitter is, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, one of the uh, social media tools that you can use uh, to participate in uh, research conversations of interest to you. I have uh, listed here for you a number of Twitter hashtags uh, which you may want to explore in order to find your research community. The library uh, had previously done a, a quick bite session on social media and that is currently on YouTube. So I will uh, would encourage you to have a look at that if you want tips on how to use social media more effectively uh, for your collaborate, for, to find collaborators as well as to uh, identify other uh, researchers. So <clears throat> we've looked at a few different search tools and fora that researchers can use to advertise themselves. I'm going to wrap up our webinar today by providing some general tips for promoting yourself as a collaborator, particularly for managing your research profile. We're going to have a look at the web profile provided by the university, but the same advice can apply to a range of social media or anywhere that you have your profile as a researcher publicly accessible. Uh, as Cami mentioned, the library offers separate sessions on managing social media as a researcher, so we're not going to be talking about that for, for, for too much time. To begin with, as research students at the university, um, you have the opportunity to, to make your contact details and key achievements publicly available. If you're working here as staff as well, chances are at least your contact details can already be found in the university phone book, an entry for which you can see on the left hand side of the, of the page at the moment. So make sure you keep your details correct and up to date. All of us change jobs, we all move around, your phone number might change, so just make sure that you, 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 you regularly review what's being put out to the public so they can contact you if they need to. Uh, also, a profile picture is very important to, to add, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. In the business school, we reach out to all of our candidates at enrolment and encourage them to create a web profile. 
Uh, so there'll be a there'll there'll be a local process in place depending on where you're studying. Uh, with a LinkedIn profile, if you don't have one, I would recommend making one. Uh, it's up to you to decide which media to engage with and what suits you. But the wider you cast your net, uh, the more bites you're going to get. Uh, your local research office can provide more detail on local processes for updating uh, your, your, your public facing profile provided by the university. Uh, so we're just going to have a look at a couple of, uh, a couple of profiles that are, are currently live. Uh, the, the, uni so the university profile uh, captures a range of information about your academic life, but it's up to you to make sure that every publication, every conference, every media appearance, every grant application and award, every class you've ever taught, every academic award should be singing your praises as a researcher. The university draws on this data from a range of systems, but at the end of the day, you're the only backstop for ensuring that your profile fully demonstrates your accomplishments. So at the moment, we're having a look at a profile for a senior academic, and as you can see, there's a bio on here. Uh, we've got information about uh, publications, uh, grants. Uh, can we scroll down a little bit and have a look at... Yeah, so so you can see that uh, that Uri's uh, you know uh, presented at a range of conferences and published papers, and and his history will go back a long way. By contrast, if we have a look at a student's uh, at a student's profile, and Nina's currently studying with us uh, in transport and logistics at the moment. Uh, there, there, there aren't grants and media appearances, but the same holds for making sure that your conference proceedings and journal articles and everything uh, appear on your website. And again, making local inquiries to your webmaster can help you to add additional uh, add additional information to this part of the site. So. Uh, as I said, your profile picture as well. Profile picture is important. Some students choose to put their picture on, others don't. But research suggests that those on, if we look at LinkedIn again as an example, you get over 20 times more views if you choose to use a profile picture and over 36 times more messages. So I would recommend that you consider getting a friend with an SLR camera, for example, take a nice picture of you on a neutral background, maybe wear a suit or, you know, something something that makes you feel confident, or even come down to the library and find a nice old looking bookshelf that you can take your picture in front of as well. Great for the academic headshots. So thirdly, uh, make sure that you think about the kind of search terms the people in your discipline area are likely to use. The more of this terminology that you can integrate into your profile information, the more likely you'll be to appear high in search results. So mention a, a lot of these terms in your bio, for example, but it may even be possible for your local webmaster to add uh, what they call meta tags in the back end of your profile architecture. So words that may not necessarily appear on the page, but will drive search results and, and, and hopefully ensure that your profile appears in more of them. So if you're interested in learning more about managing your research profile specifically, the library also runs, in addition to this webinar, an online tutorial, uh, which you'll be able to access uh, via, uh, via the link that will be provided to you uh, in, in the slides accompanying this presentation. So I guess from us, that concludes the formal uh, section of the webinar. And thank you to those of us who have joined us and those of us that are now leaving us. And we really appreciate your participation. Uh, Cammy and I are going to remain online for the next 15 minutes or so to answer any questions that you may wish to ask in relation to today's presentation. And thank you again very much for joining this installment of the Quick Bytes webinar series. Does anyone have uh, any questions that um, they would like to? Um, can you please look for this? Yes, uh, yeah, we'll uh, certainly be happy to do that. Will the slides be uh, available? Uh, we have recorded this uh, as a webinar, so this will be available on our Quick Bytes uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I think there will be a link sent out to everyone who has uh, registered for this webinar. So once uh, we've done a bit of uh, editing, uh, you'll get the link and be able to uh, review uh, this session again, including all uh, the URLs that we have put up.
I'm just going to uh, bring up the link for the last slide. Um, so this was in relation uh, to the question on um, how we can uh, raise our research profile. So the uh, hopefully you can see uh, the URL that appears at the top of the screen. It is actually also in the uh, library's research impact guide. I believe it comes under uh, the tab of research impact, but you have to scroll um, down the screen to find that. So hopefully uh, this answers your question. Uh, okay, so addressing uh, addressing um, Larissa's question about the, 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 the metadata terms. So I've had a little bit of experience with the university uh, editing web pages and adjusting content. And in quite a lot of these uh, uh, web editing systems, before you save a page and it goes live, it gives you the opportunity to add uh, metadata tags. So text that doesn't necessarily appear on the page that people look at, but text that's embedded in the page it's, it, it itself, like in the in the, in the the programming of the page, which will enable the page to appear in people's search results, even if the terms that they're searching for don't appear in your bio, for example, or amongst your or amongst your publications. Now, again, it depends on your local area's uh, webmaster and what what system they use. But it's just another aspect to consider when you are uh, constructing your 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 research profile as a way to, uh, I guess, cleverly. Uh, uh, engage with Google, for example, in order to to make you your your profile appear higher up in a wider range of searches. But we wouldn't recommend you using any particular words. I mean, that all depends on your discipline, your area of specialty, the faculty you're with, the kind of collaborations that you're trying to encourage people to to contact you in relation to. Um, I'd be happy if you wanted to to contact me after the event for more uh, for more information on that particular topic. Do we have any other questions from anyone? Okay, we've got someone typing. Yeah. A pleasure. <laughs> we will uh, put uh, details of um, our contact on the, the, the booking page uh, where you can get in touch with us. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be posted here. I think we are um, pretty much out of time. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, signing up for this and, and attending this session. Uh, we hope you found it useful. Um, and as I mentioned before, we will have uh, a copy of this webinar available on YouTube uh, shortly. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Good afternoon.